Okay, so this is the audio for Learning the Script Socialization by Judy O'Brien. Okay, so what is socialization? <laughs> it's one of those things we go over quite a bit in sociology classes, right? So in the chapter, the author asks, how do we know if someone is eccentric or if they're off, right? So this is a way to show how the process of socialization is largely subconscious and not something that we're really overtly aware of. So people who are eccentric know society's rules but choose to ignore some of them. So this could be hippies who never grow up or goths or the bookish, right? People who are strange but know they're strange and it's a sort of choice into who they are. So for example, I have a friend, one of my best friends from high school that he, um, he is a Burning Man enthusiast. For me, I'm good. Like I hear um, Sandstorm and I'm good. Like that's, it doesn't matter how freaky deaky fun, whatever. Sandstorm is like where I draw a lot of lines. So, um, but he loves that crap and <laughs> they dress eccentrically. They, you know, are just kind of bizarre in the whole thing, kind of the whole fun of it. And uh, so, yeah, he knows that that's not normative, but um, he lets his freak flag fly, right? <laughs> that kind of way. Versus there are those people who are kind of off in society. So these are people who often don't know the social rules, and so they're not able to follow them correctly. So for example, I had a friend in community college that had Asperger's, and as a result, it was really difficult for him to have a normative, youthful interaction. So what he did was develop a sort of persona of an old professor stereotype with a corncob pipe, and he would even draw like a face on his chest and make his belly the mouth and give philosophy lectures with his paunch. So this, of course, endeared him to us so much that, you know, he was definitely absorbed into the social group. And ironically, he's now a professor, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure he keeps his button, his shirt buttoned up now. So that's good. But anywho, it's, it's his act of being this persona was his way of trying to deflect any potential rejection to the persona and not to himself. So sometimes people with autism or other spectrum disorders have issues reading other people's social cues meaning that they wouldn't take the subtle hints that we read to understand each other. So this can make people feel weird around them as they make visible all of those invisible social processes that normally cement our social relationships. But it's not like they're an anomaly. There are a lot of groups and people in society that are just kind of off. And largely it's because they lack the understanding of what social rules exist. So this could be someone who is new to a region or new to a culture who violates ritual expectations because they don't know what's expected, right? So socialization is the process through which we learn cultural beliefs and social roles. And when it comes to language, through socialization, we learn the grammar that enables, enables, enables. <laughs> Maybe I didn't learn the grammar. That enables us <laughs> to behave individually, right? And seemingly spontaneous, but at the same time, we're doing so in ways that make sense to ourselves and to others because we've been socialized into this set of expectations. So socialization is a dynamic process, meaning it's not something that's just static. It's not something that just happens once. We learn and we relearn and we continue to learn throughout our life course. So when it comes to social learning as a process of interactions, uh, Berger and Luckman really looked at how we internalize society through their book, you know, the groundbreaking book, The Social Construction of Reality. So if you've heard the term social construction, which you probably have and hopefully you have because I've mentioned it several times, especially in the audio ones, um, then <laughs> that's kind of where that concept is coming from, how reality is socially constructed. So they focus on how society gets into individuals. So in the course of our everyday lives, we share with other people, we try to go along, right, we, by meeting other people's expectations of us. So we do this by internalizing the feelings and attitudes of others. And we develop a reality out of shared, mutually understood symbols and signs. So through socialization, we learn how to act in harmony with others and their beliefs and expectations start to come to frame our reality of what we think is appropriate and how we be you know, believe and act. So George Herbert and me takes us a bit farther and I won't go too in depth just because, I mean, there was a whole reading specifically on this you had to do and reading the source text can be a little bit something, but anyway. Um, so when he talks about the human mind and self-awareness, just the idea that, you know, these two things develop simultaneously while you're learning languages or in the process of learning a language, you start to develop self-awareness. 
so you know he looks at the self as an object so when a child learns language they begin to develop the ability to conceptualize because that's really what thinking is it's a process of really kind of complex interactions so when you learn to conceptualize you learn to conceptualize yourself in relation to others in society or as an object instead of just a subject so when he talks about the i the me and the generalized other he's using these terms to distinguish between feelings, reactions, and behaviors of the people as subject, or I, you know, and the internalized social awareness and evaluation of behavior, which is the me. So the me is the one who watches and observes the I and is able to guide its actions. So the I is the response of the individual to the attitude of society, and in reaction to it, we see ourselves as something external to ourself. So we internalize expectations and organize them into a set of values, what he calls the generalized other, so he also talks about primary socialization. Samid argues that this period of socialization is crucial as it's when children internalize extensive cultural attitudes and expectations. And eventually we develop a sense of self and a need for approval and acceptance that comes from that generalized other and not just from our immediate uh, significant others. So the ideal script is just how you should act in any situation. So the images and ideals we hold in our minds about proper behavior just represent the attitudes of our community, but they're passed on through our significant others, like our parents, our teachers, the peers, you know, um, the media, etc. All those things that influence us and give us an idea of how we're supposed to act in any situation. All right, so moving on to learning social roles and identities. Good old George Herbert Mead still. <laughs> I'm just kidding, sorry, he's all right. Okay, so um, he also talks about the stages of development, which I found interesting in the chapter. They only mentioned play and game, though imitation is the first. But um, play and game, it kind of makes sense in the context of developing identity that these are the two that they use. Because the play stage is the time when we start to inhabit the roles of others. Um, and this one is kind of like in the early childhood years um, where you're talking, you're old enough to kind of understand um, commands and relationships but you're often um, either before school aged or very young school aged. So this is when um, kids start playing the roles of others. So they play firefighter or princess or mom or things like that. So they're learning what those roles are and how they work in society. So, you know, if you have little kids and they're playing house, they will definitely dictate like who's in charge. Is it the parents, right? What are the, what are the kids' social roles? What are the parents' social roles? Those kind of things. And in a way with the kids when they're playing, they develop understandings about the relationships between, you know, different roles and different ex expectations in society in their kind of way that they're playing through the role, pretending to take it on on themselves, right? So the game stage is once kids, you know, enter it about, I don't know, somewhere around 10 years old, kind of, you know, not quite precise, but around there. Um, they cement the idea of the generalized other and the role in relation to other people's roles. So the example I like to give of this is uh, soccer. <laughs> I think it makes sense. So if you look at kids that are like six years old, five, six years old, they're playing soccer. It looks like chaos, right? Because the kids don't really understand. They're, they're in the play stage. They might understand their role, but they're not understanding their role in the context of other people's roles. So oftentimes, young kids, when they play soccer, they'll just be like, try and kick the ball in the goal. Like, so every kid's around the ball like rugby or something. But once you have kids that are about like 10 years old playing soccer, you start to notice that they're actually quite good. And it's because not only do they understand their own role, but they get to this game stage where they start to understand their role in relationship to others. So meaning like, I'm the goalie. That's how, what is my relationship to someone that's a midfielder or a you know, forward or someone, right? Um, and just seeing the way that each person has their own specific role and their own specific duty, that contributes towards the whole. And so it's in this way through doing this kind of interaction in the game stage that they start to understand this idea of a generalized other. So it's more so than just, um, you know, what will my parents think if I don't do well? What will my coach think or something like that? But what will they, what will society think, right? So some sources of socialization, um, obviously he talked about primary socialization and this is taking place under the influence of significant others, right? Not our, not Bay, right? In sociology, significant other just means someone that has a large influence on your socialization, especially at a young age. 
Um, so that could be our parents or grandparents or whoever it was that raised us, right? And we internalize their values, feelings, and, and attitudes as we grow. And so those become the kind of primary way that we understand how the world works. But then as we continue on through our lives, we have subsequent, subsequent sources of socialization. That's, that's a mouthful, subsequent sources. <laughs> so, uh, I can't say it five times fast, but anyway. Um, so those subsequent sources <laughs> are filtered through existing self-concept and the individual's version of the generalized other, meaning that later our peers socialize us, the media, education, other things influence us but they still have to contend with the previously socialized information that's already relating to your self-concept that you've learned before you were socialized by those other influences. All right, so continuing on this whole social learning thing, someone other than Mead, I'm just kidding, he's all right. All right, so first, um, she talks about in the chapter Norman Denzen, who has this article, um, I noticed the quotes are wrong there, oh, that's gonna bug me, significant others of the college population. So Denson did this research study to see how connected students were to their parents as they went to college and to see if that changes throughout college. So he found that during freshman and sophomore year, students were still pretty connected to their family and old friends, but by junior and senior year, they were closer to their peer groups that they met at school, showing the waning influence of parents on youth when they become adults they start to care more about what their peers think, right, than what their family influences or their primary socializers think. So this kind of shows us how we relate to different agents of socialization or from different influences throughout our life course. Um, so another important concept is reference groups. This is something we'll be coming back to a lot throughout the course. So reference groups are perspectives we adopt in accordance with our attachment to a particular group. And each group is going to have certain ideals that they represent. Um, so some will have close association with a certain group. That means that they're going to adopt the perspectives that are consistent with the behaviors and values and beliefs of that group. So the closer you are to this reference group, the more you're gonna to conform to their expectations of behavior and values, right? So um, these, these reference groups can be specific groups or abstract groups. So they can be specific groups we associate with regularly, such as like a club on campus or maybe a religious service that you go to. And they can be dispersed or abstract groups whose values we've adopted, such as, you know, being an activist, right? That's not like there's like the one place you go to hang out with the other activist, right? Obviously that's kind of a disparate group. Or they can be imaginary groups whose ideals we've derived from TV, film, literature, or other cultural sources, right? So. Um, you know, like fandoms, <laughs> I guess, in a way. Um, the concept of fandoms could be an abstract group. So your, um, you know, the values you get through a particular fandom could be what influences some of your values and beliefs. So we evaluate our self actions from the perspectives of these reference groups. And like I said before, the closer you are to the reference group, the more their beliefs and values and you know, what are expected behaviors are going to affect what behaviors you actually exhibit. So reference groups explain the adoption of different self images, which leads to different lived experiences. So to illustrate this, because that's kind of complicated, um, in the book, the example is the gap between sexual behavior and sexual identity. So many people experiment or have some sort of same sex sexual encounter whether it's a kiss or a sex act or maybe a threesome, people engage in more than heterosexuality. Yet not everyone that does identifies as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. So maybe they had one encounter, but it doesn't define their identity as, you know, or their, it doesn't define their sexual identity. So the, you know, Kinsey brought the Kinsey and his Kinsey scale brought this phenomenon to light in the supposedly sexually conservative 1950s. <laughs> where he conducted the most extensive study of American sexuality with thousands of participants from across the country, he found that while most people identified as heterosexual, a lot of them were not as strictly defined in their behavior as they were in their identity. Meaning he made this scale that would range from heterosexual to homosexual, and people rated themselves based on desire or experiences of sex acts or whatever it might be to place themselves on the scale between those two polar extremes and interestingly, the majority of people put themselves somewhere in the scale and not at the polar extremes. And this is again in the 1950s, <laughs> it kind of goes against our expectations of sexuality in the 1950s. Turns out, yes, your grandparents had sex. 
uh, showing how sexuality is socially constructed and how a sexual act alone does not dictate someone's sexual identity. That sexual identity is, is you know, kind of more complicated than that. So it's interesting just to see how your reference group or your identification, if you were identified with the queer community, then that might affect your sexual identity more than somebody who you know, has a certain baseline of desire, but doesn't necessarily act upon those desires. So it might not affect their sexual identity as, you know, um, other than heterosexual, which is of course the hegemonic value of our culture. So it's interesting how Kinsey found this idea. And of course, you know, a lot of this research has been replicated, but he did this at the time with thousands of people across the US, all the way across the country. And it was really interesting to see just how variable people's actual desires and experiences were from these ideas of you are this or you are that, because we have a very dichotomous understanding in society. We like to separate people into two groups. That way we think we can easily understand stuff, but everything is much more intricately complicated. And thank God for that, because otherwise it would just be so boring. All right, so naming experience as a process of social learning. So this is its whole other kind of complicated thing. So Becker, right, this guy, he kind of dates himself, I think, uh, by the fact that he's talking about beatniks. But anyway, um, so you can tell the kind of time period he was coming up in. So Becker is this nice young academic and he sees all the young people his age, these beatniks, meaning kind of like the pre-hippies, right? If you've ever read like any like the beat poets or, you know, Kerouac or any of that fun stuff, they're an interesting group. But anyway, they had a lot of kind of philosophical values that were definitely subcultural at the time but have now become a little bit more mainstream. And part of the subcultural um, identity was also linked to marijuana use, right? So Becker argued that, you know, and, and so basically what he did was he observed people um, using marijuana and their relationships to it and kind of the social relationship to it because the way he saw it was people were kind of being brought into a cultural value of using marijuana from you know, their already existing social group of beatniks and that getting high was something that has to be learned in an interaction with more experienced users. So, you know, like he talks about how some people don't even report feeling high their first time while others do. And so he's saying that it's more complicated than just being something physiological. So he says that we name physical experiences as social acts. So in that way, he's saying that smoking pot is more than a physiological response, but a socially constructed experience that has to be identified or named before people are able to recognize the intended effect. So this is kind of where people, some people um, have a, an experience of, you know, he said that like depending on their, their adherence to the social group, people could either have a positive experience or a very paranoid negative experience. And a lot of that had to do with the social construction of whether it was good or bad. Right, so, you know, basically he saw drug use as a socially constructed experience, saying that people do not re respond directly to the stimuli of the drug. Instead, it's through our interactions with others that we learn to assign meanings to particular experiences. So the same can be said about emotional experiences as physical experiences. So love, that's something that's a very deep internal feeling. It feels very personal. But what does it mean to fall in love? Right? Many words we have in our society convey, you know, it being fun or it being a loss of control or it being painful, right? Um, and again, you know, the metaphors uh, reading really gets into that in a lot of ways. But, you know, really the way young people learn about love, researchers looked at this and found that young people learn about love and romance through their interactions with others. So when we're young, we experience certain rules of what's appropriate within love. So it's not just some internal feeling, it's something that's also being culturally, you know, um, or socially constructed in the culture. So for example, um, culturally we believe that you should only be in love with one person at a time, or that you should only date one person at a time. So significant cultural values are passed on through this process as, you know, young people are learning from other young people what is appropriate within love or within relationships. So the significance of cultural learning in youth is just, it's, it's immense because socialization, especially in youth, results in a deeply entrenched set of cultural values and ideals. And especially with primary agents of socialization, this can be difficult to alter. Though we do have, you know, though like I said before, socialization is not a static process. 
it's dynamic. It's something that goes on throughout our life course. And it's something that, you know, adapts to our individual experiences. So as much as we might have been like, let's say you grow up in a very religious faith or something of that nature. Yeah, chances are that is the belief system that will be ingrained within you. But that doesn't mean that that's completely inherent in every person, right? Some people are either re-socialized or maybe they, you know, have a difference of opinion because of other reference groups that they form later on in life. So obviously we do change and adapt, but in a way that's why primary socialization is so important is because everything that we adapt is coming through the lens of that primary socialization we've already had. So it's important that youth have this cultural learning process so that they can kind of subconsciously understand the expectations and the values of society and what behaviors are expected of them so they'll be successful in adult life and be accepted as part of the reference groups that they want to be a part of.